Tucker's been clinically dead for at least four and a half minutes. He has one chance left. I've lost it. Stand clear. Stand clear. Stand clear. Mid afternoon, and Harry spots a beginner on a bodyboard. The rip is sweeping him out to the giant waves crashing onto the point. The young bloke was about 200 metres offshore, so I knew I had a bit of a paddle on my hands to get out to him. But when the swell's up like this, you know, you can lose someone so quick, and that thought of losing a young bloke in a big swell like this, it'd take ages for us to even search for his body. Over this way. I approach the guy and the first thing I tell all of them if they've got boards is take the leg rope off. They don't want to let go. Everyone wants to hold something. Everyone likes their blankie. Yeah, let go. You want to take your board off your arm? Did you take the board off your arm? I don't want his board hitting me. I don't want to hit me in the head and, I, and it's going to get in the way when I'm paddling. Backed up against the rocks, Harry's battles to make open water. I don't want to be anywhere near the rocks. You come near the rocks, you get injured, you get sucked down the face, something happens to you. I want to stay on the board and I want to stay in water. The bodyboarder's name is Josh, a visitor from interstate. He tries desperately to help paddle. You can see the swell increase and the sets are getting bigger. All of a sudden, the wild, nature owns you. Unable to penetrate the waves, Harry's finds a soft landing on the rocks. I'm up the face of the rocks. I'm standing now. Natural instinct is to run away from the crashing wave, but Harry's knows he must do the opposite. Jump into the wave. Jump into the wave. And then we just leap. Go, go, go. go. It washes us back up onto the, onto the spot that we're actually standing in. So, you know, we are so damn lucky. I see a second wave approaching, and I've just got to get this bloke. I've got to get him to run across the rock ledge and get him out of there. Harry's experience pays off, and Josh is able to scramble to safety. But almost immediately, another victim is identified. I look straight back in the rib, and there's a second guy in the same spot on his board. There's no way in hell he's getting out of it. If I paddle back through that rib, I've got 10 to 12 foot waves that are crushing. I need him to come out through that rib to me so I can guide him up to the boat ramp. The second patient has paddled up right beside me. I've got him out right beside me, and I said, take your leg rope off. Hurry up. Same as the bodyboard. I don't want the board anywhere near me. Take the board, jump on this one. The board has been hired from a local surf shop, and the man doesn't want to lose his deposit. He's arguing with me. Let that board go. Let the board go. He wants the board. Paddling back to shore against the rip is impossible. So, Harry's aims for the boat ramp nearby. So I'm trying to utilise the ocean now. I'm trying to go with the strength of the ocean and come right up that boat ramp. Harry's has moments to get the man to safety before the next set of monster waves. So we, we come really close to the ramp and I, I try and get him off the board so I can at least just dock him on the boat ramp. The swell just pulls down again. He's, he's not out of the woods. He's a couple of metres still off the rocks. And I just thought to myself, oh, God, this is it. You know, if I don't get him up in the next couple of seconds, he could die. Go, 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 go. Come down, give me a hand. I had these critical seconds where I just knew if he didn't get up the rocks, it was all over. And then I've seen the wave approach. I didn't want to go up the rock face myself, so I had to turn the board around and I had to go into the swell. I just seen on the corner of my eyes, I, I seen him get docked. 
and he was, he was going up those rocks nice and quick. It was a lot of relief for me, like I had a smile on my face. It's, you know, you've just saved two guys that pretty much, you know, would have drowned or, or gone under. Harry's even manages to rescue the higher board. So the man, an English backpacker, won't lose his rental deposit. On shore, 18-year-old Josh, the first man Harry's rescued, is grateful to be alive. You did well what I was trying to do. I was trying to, you know, as he explained, to dive into the yeah. wave. And, like, you just see that you can run up the rocks and you're in two thoughts. Yeah. You know, so you did really well. Cheers, man. You look like a cat on a hot tin roof when you're <laughs> coming across there. Welcome back, baby. <laughs> oh, I'm here for my 18th. You're here for your 18th? Yeah, I turned 18 two weeks ago. No way. Yeah. I would have nearly had to blow the candles out for him. <laughs> <laughs> The fate of these two girls weighs on Jethro's shoulders. I could see that they were youngish girls and the fear was in their eyes. They were screaming for help when I was paddling out, so I, you just got to go. You got to go hard. They might not make it. When you're rescuing young kids, time's on your side. You really don't know how long, how long they got left in them to fight. Jethro learns why the girls couldn't hear earlier warnings from lifeguards. Because they're deaf. They looked at each other in a weird way as if like to acknowledge what was going on and they worked together as a team and yeah, never seen anything like it. young girls are sisters. On shore, Harrison looks for their parents. If I could hear the screams 50 metres away on the beach, surely the parents could hear the screams. It's the grandmother. She's dead. The grandmother has been trying to signal the girls for the last 10 minutes. She was on the water's edge helpless. She couldn't let anyone know that her kids are in trouble. She couldn't run up to us, you know. She just started doing sign language to me, and I felt my heart sunk a bit, actually. We didn't know we was moving back, and yeah. Me and Samantha thought it was going to be fun way back, but we would drown because water splashed over my face. I told Savannah, why you say help? When you're out in the water, you hear, you know, the seagulls, the crashing of the waves. They couldn't hear anything. Not being able to hear anything or knowing that the lifeguard's coming to get you, that's... it would be your worst nightmare. I learned from school about rip, and I thought it might be rip, so I do below what teacher taught us. Say help, yeah. Down here we see people from so many different walks of life and it definitely makes you reflect and, and realise how good our job is down here at the beach. When you rescue two girls like that, yeah, it feels really good to send them home. I'm watching a father and his daughter in the foreground and then all of a sudden I see this young girl. She's going to go under and if she goes under and disappears into that deep hole, Another 30 seconds or another 40 seconds underwater, it's, it's like you find her or she's gone. Get the board. Get in the water. Hope you don't get s slowed up by waves coming in. And then sprint to the patient. close to all the 30 seconds to get to her. Yeah, she was definitely uh, at a point, a serious point by the time I made contact with her. Right. Right. Okay, I'll take you in safely, OK? You know, we rescue thousands of adults a year, um, but we might only do a handful of kids, little kids, you know, and uh, every time one of the boys does a rescue of a kid, it's a big deal. Oh, my God.
My daughter yeah. nearly drowned then. Yeah. Okay, you need to go to the red and yellow flag. Yeah. Watch your back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, especially with young kids like that, because I lost my son. I know that feeling. Sorry, guys. My boy was trapped in the birth canal and had complications which cut the oxygen off for 10 minutes. But the result was a week later that he died. Whenever I do a rescue of a young child, that comes to the surface. If she'd lost that beautiful little girl, she'd know what I'm talking about, you know? Oh my god, never follow me, okay? Jeffy, never follow me, me in studies. I might get into danger. And you're smaller and weaker swimmer than me, so you can't always follow me. Okay. Max thinks he's seen something in the water. But then it's gone. I was looking at the flag and I was wondering, is there actually a person behind there? <laughs> Whatever's there is obscured from view by the flag. The flag is in the middle. 500 metres to the north, <laughs> Chapo has a clear view. And then all of a sudden, the guy popped out from behind the flag, and I was like, wow, we really need to get this guy. It's unclear how long the man has been struggling against the rip. We got a swimmer. The, the, he could swim out, and now he got stuck. As I got closer, I realised, I'm in here. This guy's not good. man bounces off the bottom. He's up here. He's coming back up. He's going under. Oh, he's on. Each wave costs Harrison vital seconds. It's very close to him, yep. As precious seconds tick away, the man barely has enough energy to keep his head up. Yeah, 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 you got him. But that's when I'd noticed that closer in, there was another guy who was just in the same amount of trouble. Another man has drifted into exactly the same spot. But from the tower, he's also hidden by the flag. Mario is unaware Harrison has a double rescue on his hands and needs backup. I turned the board around and I tried to catch a wave in, but on the angle, so I could pass him and, and collect him on the way through. In my head, it, I thought it would go to plan. It didn't go to plan. Mario can't see the second swimmer behind the flags, so Chapo races to back up from the other end of the beach. To me, they look like they're in a lot of trouble. Chapo and someone else. Overshooting the second patient poses a new dilemma to Harrison. Who to help next? I told the first guy to just don't let go. Really dangerous to go out and try and rescue someone with no equipment because they're going to see you afloat and they're just going to jump all over you. They don't care if they take you down with them. Chapo battles the waves. In a panic, the man pushes Harrison underwater. In that situation, Harrison was well in control of what he was doing. He just needed my help to do it more effectively. The first guy who was getting rescued is being boarded in now. Yeah, all good. Back on the beach. The two men are part of a Korean tour group. 
They swam in a strong rip. We, we saw them just, and it was very touch and go, yeah. They were, you know, whether we say seconds, I'm not sure, but if we're not here, they drown. I told you, between the flag, we got, we're only allowed to huh? inside between the flag. It's too far from here. <laughs> Jesse spots a group of swimmers getting into trouble at the north end. Yeah, boys, uh, you're gonna have to go straight in. Chris and Jake have to rescue a girl and two guys. The thing that scared me the most was that it was such a short period swell, which means that the waves are constantly breaking after each other. So you don't really have time if you roll to get ready again, because the next wave's already gonna hit you. Jake reaches the girl but is pushed back. Chris makes it through to the other two swimmers, the teenager and an older man. Jake has the girl, but fights the waves. This is gonna be the hardest thing now, getting them back in, because the rip's so strong, it's gonna suck them out the back. Even if you're the best lifeguard in the world, if a three-foot wave hits you for patient on, you're falling off. As much as I want to help Jake and Chris, I just can't leave the tower unattended. If I do that, there's another 800 metres of the beach that's going to be unpatrolled. Chris gets his two patients to safety, but learns of a fourth swimmer in trouble. Another one. Jake, you need more? You need more? And then I seen Chris grab another guy. Then, Jesse spots yet another person in trouble, a fifth swimmer further up the beach. Both available lifeguards can't be contacted in the water. What do I do, you know? I can't leave the tower. This guy out here, I just want to take my eyes off this guy out the back. Jay, Jay. Jesse has to find a solution to his dilemma, or this man could drown. And then, it's out of nowhere, I just thought, you know, hoppers across the road. Head lifeguard Hoppo is in his office just behind the tower in the Bondi Pavilion. Hey, uh, Hop, are you across the road, mate? I might uh, need someone just to come to the tower. I might need to go down and help the boys here. Hey, mate. I'll uh, hop out. Jesse has to cover 400 metres in the buggy. I was trying to start it, and I knew people were drowning, and it wouldn't start. And then all of a sudden, it just started, and I just pinned it, not even noticing how fast I got. Okay. Another one falling off the bank that Jesse's got gone in for. Moments before Jesse reaches the patient, a pair of experienced body surfers hold the swimmer up. These things happen. Get two or three go at the same time makes it a bit more difficult. All five swimmers are accounted for. <laughs> Thank you. 17 year olds Jai and Natasha are on holiday from Melbourne. Just too strong today. Yeah, it was just really rough, I think. It was, a bit rough today. Really yeah, big. a bit hard. And we're pretty confident swimmers, so thank God they were there, though. That's awesome. At risk of being overwhelmed by inexperienced swimmers, lifeguards break out the big guns. So the jet ski on a day like this is fantastic. It really keeps all lifeguards on the beach. The jet ski then does all the rescues, and it's rare then a board has to go in. Within minutes of launching, Jake is called to action. There's about oh, 30 people in that rip out the back of the flags. All right, everyone, go in, please. Help us out. Look how many people we got here. We don't need you all out here. If you can't swim, please go back to shore. Thank you. I think I was in the water for about 20 or 30 seconds before I was, like, picking up swimmers off the back of the flags. Yeah, 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 yeah. Get on, get on, get on. Just seconds earlier, these swimmers were standing in shallow water. They were just getting pulled off the back of the sandbank and they all just sort of clambered on. Stop, stop. Four swimmers hang off the ski. Go, get off. Out the back, more are in trouble. Sensing a potentially disastrous situation, Hoppo moves to a cover position. 
There's like 30 people waiting there. There's some mass rest. Then at the north end, lifeguards spot a woman struggling in a rip. Well, she's starting to panic a bit. This one sort of caught us off guard, and when we put our eyes on the rip that she was in, she was going under, and it was one of those moments where you're like, where's the lifeguards? Everyone's pretty far away, and, and she's in dire straits. Loaded with swimmers, Jake can't leave his position. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We got, we got there, the boys have spotted a, a woman in the rip, and she's really struggling. The situation has also caught the attention of volunteer lifesavers. I'm in, mate. He's going to go. I'm like, come on, mate. He's put some big paddles in because this chick, seriously, she's going down. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh. She, that person is so drowning right now. There's two of them. Oh, Just when we thought we couldn't get any worse, there's two more heads in the same rip, and they weren't looking good either. Oh, my God. Where did that even come from? So we've got three people now needing help. We've got one jet ski in the water and lifeguards scattered everywhere. Oh, she went under. Oh, my God. Go, mate. From the tower, it's one of the scariest things as a lifeguard because you're watching someone drown and it goes in slow motion the time the buggy's getting to that person and you're literally sitting there helpless watching them sink. Oh, my God. By the time Hoppo was radioed to go in and he was paddling out, I'd seen it from there. you just got to get there as quick as possible. On the way out, a good Samaritan is helping one of the struggling men. He desperately calls for Hoppo to help his friend further out. So when I got to the guy, it was choppy conditions. He was panicking, but his concern wasn't about himself. It was more about the other woman. At the back of the rip, a young surfer and a volunteer lifesaver have saved the woman's life. That kid just saved that chick's life. Jake arrives for the pickup. All right, Jake's there. Oh. Hoppo collects the man. We've got her, we've got her. Get on. She wasn't the best swimmer and she'd been sort of fighting that rib. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. She wasn't in a good way. She was a bit, bit distressed when I got to her. Jump on the mat, jump on the mat. Yeah. Even once all the resources arrive and you think the scenario is over, someone who's been fighting a rip for a minute that can't really swim, they've they've completely fatigued and there could be a rescue board right in front of them and they just can't grab it. So all of a sudden the rescue's not over. All on, all on. So that's it. Holy shot up as oh. Yeah, jump up, jump up, jump up. Saving someone's life, wrangling a jet ski and and, and managing that all at once, that hats off to him. He, he's done a great job. You can even hear the panic on Hop's face. Yeah, yep, I'm in. Yeah, I've never heard Hop panic. I've never yeah. heard Hop panic. That was one of the first times I've heard Hop over. Just wig it. Yeah, what was Hop in? Once you hear Hop start wigging out, start stressing and, and even running, that's when you know it's serious. A man's found floating, lifeless in the surf. His name is Takahiro Ono, an English language student from Tokyo. No one knows what's happened to him or how long he's been in the water. Riley Mo, Riley Mo, no, someone go and get on the uh, radio. There's a radio on my bike and call for the deep here. Yeah. Hoppo can't detect a pulse. Bagging, come on. He's not breathing. Bagging, come on, come on. Bagging. Tucker is clinically dead. You grab the nose. The boys must get his heart beating again and air into his lungs. I can't really feel that. Yeah, mate. Danny arrives with a defibrillator as Corey starts CPR. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, get a towel, get a towel. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Luke, what? what? Tucker still has no pulse. Stand clear, stand clear. Watch out. Everyone stand clear. 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 Stand Check pulse. Give no pulse. Give CPR. Check pulse. There's no pulse. Give CPR. I can't get one. Start CPR. The deep trip doesn't work on Tucker first time. The machine needs time to recharge. Corey continues CPR. Eleven. Twelve. It's four minutes since lifeguards got to Tucker. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six, 
Seven, eight, the machine needs nine, time to establish whether he has any heart rhythm. Stand clear. Do not touch patient. Analyzing rhythm. Tucker's had two shocks. He's in spasm. Patients rarely survive if they need more than three shocks. Tucker's been clinically dead for at least four and a half minutes. He has one chance left. The third shock has finally had an effect. Still staying good? Staying good, staying good. Analyzing rhythm. Oh, wow. Rhythm, yeah. It's alright, mate, it's alright. There's no pulse, give CPR. He's got a yeah. faint pulse. He's got rhythm, mate. It's getting stronger. Take a good pulse, mate. Good pulse here. Okay. He's been in the water and you swallowed a lot of water, okay? Stay, just relax, mate, just, just relax. relax. We're looking after you, okay? Understand? He's got a strong heartbeat now, strong heart. Just, just keep your head there, mate. It's okay. Just give you some oxygen. It's okay, it's okay. Mate. It's all right, buddy. It's okay, mate. Just relax. Just take it easy. Good work, boys. All of his eight. Good work. No one knows how long Tucker was clinically dead in the water. But for five minutes, the lifeguards kept him alive on the sand. Despite the trauma of a major medical emergency, Tucker knows who and where he is. What's your name? Takahiro. is it? Yeah. Lifeguards and paramedics brace him on a spinal board. One, two, three, roll. They're concerned Tucker may also be suffering a spinal injury. Perhaps he was violently knocked out in the surf. Was it, was it immersion related or...? You think so. He was found at the edge Can of the water. Can you feel me clutching right. your elbow? So you pulled him out of the water. Yeah. Have you used it on an arrest before? Oh, we used to. We had 12 last year. Did you? Yeah. Oh, they're unreal, these things. Unbelievable. Oh, it's, it's got to have someone behind it, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you blokes did all right. Tucker's alive, but the drama's far from over. How did he end up floating lifeless in the water? Has he damaged his spine? Will he suffer any brain damage from lack of oxygen? Thanks, well mate. done, you Thanks. saved his life. You're yeah. great, you blokes. A dead look is a real weird sort of look. You know they're basically dead when you see them. And to actually know when you feel, you can't feel a pulse, watch the defib shock them, and then actually get them back breathing and, and with a pulse, it's like an, it's an amazing feeling that you probably can't really describe in words, but how you really feel. As the boys debrief, Tucker arrives at St Vincent's emergency. But what happened to Tucker? Swedish tourist Isabella was the first to find him lying in just a foot or two of water. Yeah, and I just saw a guy who was like, I thought he was joking, he was just swimming, swinging around because he was like, mm -hmm. but then he was like turning around and I saw his eyes, he was like yeah. wide open. It was, then I thought, shit, so I was like, are oh, you okay? And I pulled him up, he didn't answer, so, and his head was, very well. He did a good, he did job. good job. But he was dead. He was, yeah, he was dead. He was dead. He was dead. Oh, shit. <laughs> the defib shocked three times. We had to shock him three times to get the heart going again. Tucker's vital signs are healthy. Now, emergency doctors need to find out what caused his heart to stop beating. Okay, so you're going to feel a sharp scratch in a minute, okay? There's still concern about Tucker's neck and spine. Is it sore here? Sore in your neck anywhere? So at the moment we're treating him with spinal precautions in case he was uh, dumped and he's had a spinal injury. X-ray. But also we're treating him as though he may have had a primary problem with his heart. His heart may have gone into a funny rhythm causing him to drown or nearly drown. So we're not really sure which came first at the moment so we're just trying to work that out at the end at this stage. Tucker will soon learn he's got a long-term medical problem to deal with. Bondi was our last stop. We only had half an hour to have lunch and have a swim. So um, we raced into the water to have our swim and we were just about ready to leave when um, whatever happened to Tucker happened. Tests reveal Tucker probably hasn't damaged his spine. However, doctors can't yet determine whether he drowned or may have suffered a heart problem in the water.